Dog and Two Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. This two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thank you to our generous underwriters here on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Hear more at lutherclassical.org. On this Thursday, July 21st, we are studying Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. He reigns over all the earth. He judges all people in righteousness. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Chris Hull. Pastor Hull serves at Zion Lutheran Church in Tomball, Texas. Pastor Hull, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Well, Brother Apple, thank you for having me. As always, it is a pleasure. And fun times. Indeed. 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 (laughs) <laughs> Pastor Hall, as we look at Psalm 96, give us some context. What should we know as we prepare to look at this psalm? I mean, it's a psalm, right? Not the psalms, but psalm. The P is kind of silent. So I don't know if, you, if you've all talked about that yet, the silent P. <laughs> we, we had it. I, I appreciate you getting that one so out of the way. It's, you never know. You never know. You can assume, hey, everybody knows this, but it's kind of like insider information. Well, not really, because you don't go to jail for it. But it's nice to know it's Psalms, not Psalms. And if you do that, it's, it's okay. But this is one of those lovely Psalms that a lot of them are in this context. Is the context of worship. When we read through the Psalms, we almost read through it like any other book of the Bible. We start Psalm 1, go to Psalm 150. Some even calling it chapter, like chapter 96, verse 5. And, and that's not how it is. It's psalms these songs singing to the lord some are psalms of lament some are confessions some are praise some are corporate in nature some are private in nature like psalm 51 written by david carried along by the holy spirit after in his sin with uriah's wife and the death of his son and the confrontation with nathan and his repentance and then you have other psalms that are psalms of corporate nature where everybody is singing to the Lord. Like Psalm 96 we have today is this exhortation to sing to the Lord a new song. You have this glory to God. And it's not just to a certain people as you get later in the psalm, it's to all the nations. So it's all of creation, everyone glorifying and singing the song to the Lord. So it's beautiful stuff. There's a note in the Lutheran Study Bible that says Psalm 96 is also made use of in 1 Chronicles 16 when David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, which I think adds some flavor to this. There's also a note that I find find intriguing that in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the title for this psalm indicates that it was used when the temple was rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity, which I also think adds a little bit of, of flavor to the the psalm. And again, it puts it in that context of worship, as you were saying. Well, exactly. And that's the thing is these psalms aren't written in a vacuum. It's not like Solomon or David went into their room privately and said, I'm going to come up with this. It's always as all worship is, is in response to God's gifts, his giving. And we respond in praise, thanks and serving and obeying him. That's how we respond to him. And that's what you have with these psalms. David rejoicing and bringing the Ark of the Covenant, the temple being rebuilt after captivity. And even we, when do we sing psalms in worship? We sing them as we're entering the holy place in the intro. We sing it as we enter into the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary from where, from which, from where, from where comes the gifts of the cross for you. Let's go ahead and take a look at Psalm 96 this morning. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. 
Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. That is Psalm 96. Pastor Hall, very early in the psalm, we are told to sing three times, in fact, in just those first three verses, and that continues throughout the psalm. Why this emphasis on singing in Psalm 96? Because we can. I mean, why not sing? There's so many reasons to sing. Like I said, for the first one, one is you can sing. And I always love when people tell me, well, I can't sing. It's it's not my forte. I'm not a good singer. It's like, well, yes, you are. You, you just maybe need to learn what your singing voice is. You may be a bass, a baritone, a tenor, an alto soprano. Me personally, I'm a uh, soprano. Surprising, right? But not really. I'm kidding, uh, everybody. Not it a is surprising. soprano. But the reality is, We all sing. We sing hymns. We sing jingles from TV. We sing songs from Jimmy Buffett to ACDC to the Carpenters to Zach Brown Band to whoever you listen to, Brother Apple. Do you listen to like 1940s jazz type music or something? I don't know what your shtick is. I'm more of a classic country guy myself. I see. So you listen to like Florida Georgia line then. That's what you mean, right? Uh, sort of, <laughs> not quite. I think Merle Haggard, George Jones, there, George Strait. There you go. Those folks. And that's the thing, you know, uh, when when George Strait comes on the radio, you sing along to it. You sing in the shower, you sing in the car. The, the thing is, the people of God sing not just because they can, but because they're gifted to. We're gifted to sing. We sing when we're happy. We can sing when we're sad. We sing the blues and we sing joyful tunes. We just sing. That's what God's creation does. There's a great book written by J.R.R. Tolkien called The Similarian. Have you read this book or no? The The Silmarillion. There you go. I never pronounce anything I right. Heard in pronunciation. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to go cry now because I can't pronounce anything uh, properly. But you, you taught me to pronounce Psalms today. There we so. go. We both helped each other then. But you've read the book then. I have. It's been a while. But But you remember how everything's kind of created is singing it into creation. There's this song. I I think I think that's the same way Aslan creates. Mm -hmm. Is that the magician's nephew in the Chronicles of the Yeah, You have this singing and both Lewis and Tolkien get that from Scripture. This reality of how God gives music to life. So when we sing and it's different than like even try handing this psalm to a congregation and have them read it all together at the same time. Everybody will be a couple words off because no one is reading it at the same pace, but you set a tune to that and everybody is singing with one voice. And it's beautiful because that tune is an additional gift from God for us. You see it later in the Psalm with the trees and creation singing. And if you're, quiet enough, (laughs) not in some hippie type way, but in a new creation where you hear, you hear the, the sounds of the waves, you hear the sounds of trees blowing with the wind and everything is in praise to God who has created it. So we sing because we can, we sing because we're gifted to, and we sing because it's in response. We sing our heritage, like you mentioned from Chronicles and the Babylonian captivity of the the people of God. Why did David write this, bringing the Ark of the Covenant? We tell our story. We sing our story. And we've kind of lost this in modern day because song is all around us. You go to the gym, there's music in the background. You go in the elevator, there's music in the background. You go to the grocery store, 
You're bobbing your head along to Olivia Rodrigo before you even know it. There's music everywhere. So we've almost forgotten how precious song is and what it can do and does for us. Hmm. So, I mean, you, you mentioned that sometimes you'll hear people in, in the church say, well, I can't sing, which I'm, I'm convinced that's a lie that the devil puts into our minds, mm-hmm. that we can't sing because he knows how powerful the gift of music is, particularly when it's attached to the word of God. But, but with that thought, you know, there is that thought, well, I, I can't sing or I'm not good enough to sing or maybe I don't want to sing. That, that doesn't seem like something that is cool to do or something like that. What, what do we miss out on? What do we lose if we don't sing? Well, take an example, like Easter Sunday. We'll take Good Friday to Easter Sunday. Good Friday, you sing, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, you know, by uh, Bernard of Clairvaux and then translated by um, Paul Gerhard. And you sing that hymn and it brings you into the context of Christ, the suffering he did there in your stead. And you, you experience the grief, the pain, the sorrow. You're there with him in that song. And then you bring it to the joy on Easter Sunday, where you sing, I know my Redeemer lives. And you belt it out along with Job, the reality of the resurrection and how it changes everything about your life and the joy it brings to you. When you don't sing and you just kind of sit there, you... You miss out on a part of that experience with God. Not that it's all about feeling, but it is. God affects you. You experience him. It's not just head knowledge. Okay, I know what this hymn is. I've sung it in the midst of my sorrow and in the midst of my joy. You sing that. And if you don't have that, you you miss out on how God's people talk to each other and how they share the word with each other. All right, that's a really helpful answer that we, we would miss out on the way that God's people talk to each other. I, I think I've mentioned this previously in a, a study on one of the Psalms that one of the moments that really stands out to me is in the, the after the proper preface, where the proper preface ends, you know, therefore with angels and archangels <laughs> and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, mm-hmm. that's what the pastor says, but then the people sing. And I think that that moment really gets to what you're saying, that this is just what the people of God do. This is the way they talk to God and to each other is they sing. They, they can't help it. Almost like in a musical, you know, people just sort of break out into song suddenly <laughs> as if it's entirely normal. Well, that's what the church does. So we break out into song at what God has done because that's entirely normal. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's countercultural nowadays. Musicals are not what everyday life is, but it's how the church is. So you want to be countercultural. Don't, I mean, going to rallies can be fun. Going for walks can be fun. Go to church and sing. Sing in your car. Sing at work. Are they going to fire you because you sang a hymn? Well, wouldn't that be a fun way to be, reason to be fired? It, or if you were a pastor and that happened, that'd probably be bad, but hopefully that, that wouldn't be the case. The reality is you look at why we sing. It's not just because we can, because we're gifted to. It's how we speak to each other. It's how we hand over stories. It's how we confess the truth. It's how we bear the cross. That's look at Luther. He wrote a mighty fortress is our God based off Psalm 46, right after the plague came through Wittenberg in 19, not 19, 1527. So you're there with Luther as he sees death all around him. His own daughter died that year that he wrote that. So when he says, take they are life, goods, fame, child and wife, you know, he experienced that and you sing it. But how does Luther sing it? It's not some dirge. It is a triumphant march unto eternity. And it's beautiful. Yeah, that really is. It's such a powerful hymn. And and over and over again, these hymns, they do give voice to the story of what God has done so that we would remember it and that we would proclaim it then to our our church, to the ne- to the world, to the next generation over and over again. Now, one thing that, that stands out then in this psalm is that the psalmist says, sing to the Lord a new song. I mean, so far, Pastor Hall, you've been talking about, well, old songs, like A Mighty Fortress, or O Sacred Head Now Wounded. These are pretty old songs. What's the 
What's the new song that the psalmist has? Well, and new doesn't mean contemporary. It doesn't mean it's written today. New means, (laughs) I know you, Pastor Apple, you're such a silly guy. Uh, New means this is something God has done. It's not a song of the world. It is a song of eternity. Our hymnody is not secular. It may have a secular tune, possibly, But the words do not come from this world. They don't come from the old creation, the fallen creation. Our hymns, the songs of the church, are of the new creation, the one that Christ has redeemed, ransomed in his blood, wounds, and death. So when we sing a new song, we are singing of our Lord Jesus Christ and the work he has done, that he has gone to make all things new, that he has given us new life, fresh life, eternal life, in his death and resurrection. So when we say, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth is, hey, the old song of death is over. We sing the new song of death being swallowed up by death and life given to all in Jesus Christ. That's a very fantastic answer, Pastor Hall, that the new song comes from the new creation. And and so if you're singing, quote, an old song, one that you already know, or one of the, quote, old favorites, that doesn't mean that it's an old song that goes against Psalm 96. Rather, what makes it the new song is that it speaks of God's deliverance. And, you know, and when you look at songs within the Word of God, one that stands out from the get-go, if you go all the and you maybe could, could go before this, Pastor Hall, but the one that stands out to me comes from Exodus 15, mm. the Song of the Sea, is it sometimes called, or the Song of Moses? Mm-hmm where the people rejoice in what the Lord has done in bringing them out of slavery in Egypt. But as you look at the the other songs, including Psalms that go forward from there, it's remarkable how often those songs will take elements of the quote old song and then make them new or renewed, but always because of something that God has done. So when you, I mean, you look at the Exodus and how the language of the Exodus gets used, say in, from the return from exile, which then gets used again when we talk about our Lord Jesus Christ and his exodus, as he even says it is at the transfiguration. And then all the way into the book of Revelation, it's this song of God's work of salvation being repeated over and over again, maybe with with new nuances, but it's that same song being, maybe we say renewed always because of something that God is doing. That's what makes it the new song. Well, exactly. Take the Magnificat song of Mary. God has reversed everything. He has flipped everything on its head. And that's what you're seeing here. Those who are poor are made rich. Those who are rich are sent away empty. Those who are filled are sent away empty. This reality of how God works. And the people of God sing these. We sing the Benedictus. We sing the Magnificat. We sing the Te Deum, which is that confession. It's not found in scripture, but it's that early sung creed of the church. We sing Exodus. We sing Hannah's song from Samuel. You sing these hymns of thanksgiving, of confession, and it's all God's work for you. That's why they're always new. Be it one that was written last year by Stephen Starkey, one written by Luther in the 16th century, or one written by Ambrose of Milan in the 4th century. They're all new songs because they sing of our life in Christ. With this understanding of the new song, not meaning when it was written, whether it was written in 2022 or it was written in the 400s, why why is it important that we hold on to the new song from previous generations? In, in other words, why do we need to sing old hymns? We sing old hymns, not because it's a tried and true. It's bad, it? Well, no, we don't sing it because they're like tried and true. Oh, the church loved them before. We sing them because the same Christ who saves us today is the same Jesus who saved them back then, the same Jesus who saved Hannah and Moses and Aaron and Zipporah, who saved Mary and Elizabeth and Zachariah, who saved Ambrose and Augustine, who saved Luther, who saved Timothy Dudley Smith and Starkey and Franzman, Spiritus, Nikolai, Gerhard. 
These are the, the hymns of people who are saved by Christ. So we sing them. We can sing one someone wrote yesterday or someone wrote the day after Christ rose from the dead. Why? Because they are the songs of those who are saved. They're, as Bob Marley once said it, redemption songs. And that's what we sing. Songs of us being redeemed. And, and these hymns are not just for him, correct? They're also for her. I think so. There's some guy that came up with that. I don't know who. Program about that, don't you? <laughs> oh, but no, but that, that's the thing is, it's not just our rich hymnody. Look at the Psalter. Luther would sing all 150 Psalms at least two, if not three times a week when he was in the monastery. And when he came out of that, he didn't do the, the daily hours anymore, but he still was saturated by the vocabulary of the Psalter, by the language of the liturgy. This is our way of talking. We don't talk like the world does. We've begun to do that, or we've done it for a while because we stopped singing so much. We have a new soundtrack, and it's for some reason the soundtrack of the world, rather than the good old soundtrack of God's people who sing of being ransomed and delivered. So that's what we're just going to keep on doing then. Yeah, and Psalm 96 encourages us to do so again multiple times, three times in the first two verses, sing to the Lord. And so we're singing a new song, and you've already started to, to take us into this theme that we see in Psalm 96, that it is all the earth that sings to the Lord ultimately. What is, what's the emphasis there? Well, the reality is Christ has redeemed his creation. When you look at what Christ has done, everything is his. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. So he then sends the apostles out to baptize, commune, and teach. Christ has redeemed everything. He's redeemed all of creation. So all of it is, is for him. We don't have to come up with a green initiative in the church. There already is one in the blood of Christ. That everything is precious to the Lord for our benefit and to give glory to him. So when we look at all of creation praising the Lord, it's showing the vastness of what Christ has done for us in his death and resurrection. So when we look at singing, and this is the other thing, when you sing, it's not just for in the walls of church. You can sing anywhere, anytime. And what a blessing that is. It really is. And and in today's world, as you said, where there's always kind of this background music such that maybe we don't even realize it's there. I think when the the song of the church pierces through that and people hear it, they listen. They listen, and I, I've I've had this experience. Maybe you have when I sing, particularly in a in a nursing home, mm-hmm. and especially when it's just like me and the one person in their room will be doing the the divine service there, and and we'll sing a hymn together, and. And it's amazing how many times people will say, I, I really appreciated you singing. Like that catches their attention. And that, or maybe they'll even ask, Why were you singing? You know, people like they need to hear the church sing because the soundtrack of the world, I like the way you said that. The soundtrack of the world just is kind of always there and it's really dull and, and boring and I mean just it drains the energy. Mm-hmm. But the the song of the church that is what really gives life. And so how how necessary is it for us to sing? As you said, not just within the, the sanctuary of the, our congregations, but everywhere we are to sing this song. Uh, Dr. Todd Peppercorn, you know, at um, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, gave me a new word I, I'd never knew of before. He said his wife taught him this. And it makes sense. Wives always teach their husbands more than husbands, their wives, I think. And she's an opera singer. And it's this word squealo. Have you heard this squealo? That's a new one yeah. to me, Pastor Hall. So he, he says what it is, is you can have a whole orchestra and everybody is singing. Everybody's singing, playing. And there's this one note that either soprano, alto, someone will sing it that one tone that cuts through everything else. You still have all of that noise, but the squealo, that one sound cuts through everything and can be heard. And that's the gospel. In the midst of all the busyness of this life, this world, 
We sing the gospel and it cuts through the darkness. It cuts through the busyness. It cuts through the anger and the ambition and the pride. It cuts through the despair and the doubt and the worry. It cuts through all of it. So when you sing, you are an operatic singer squealing your way through everything and cutting into the world saying, this is who Christ is for you. And we sing it. You sing it with the the vibrato of Pavarotti. You belt it out. Why not? (laughs) I mean, it's, it's joyful. It should, there's a, there's a documentary that, Oh, who directed Goodfellas? Oh, I can't remember his name. Oh, you're asking. I know I'm asking the wrong guy. Oh, it'll come to me eventually, but he's a director. Scorsese, Martin Scorsese. He did a documentary on this group called The Band. And the documentary is called The Last Waltz. And before the movie starts, it's a black screen and it just has words in white that say, this movie should be played loud. And and that's the reality of the church. We sing and cut through the stuff of this world and it overcomes everything. Or to put it another one. Oh, no, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so so listen to the psalm, sing to the Lord. As other psalms say, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Let the, the earth hear that gospel squealo so that they might hear of their salvation in Christ. We need to take a, a quick break here. Pastor Hall, you're listening to Sharper Iron. We're talking about Psalm 96 this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, July 21st. We are studying Psalm 96 with Pastor Chris Hull. He serves at Zion Lutheran Church in Tomball, Texas. Pastor Hull, we've been talking quite a bit about singing, as this psalm does. And this this psalm does give content to our singing. And we've talked about this, that we are to bless God's name in verse 2, tell of his salvation, declare his glory, his marvelous works. Uh, what are all these, what, how do all these fit into the singing of the Christian church? Well, we look at like the works of the Lord. We always go to creation. You look at mountains and rivers and it is majestic. Like if you're here in the great state of Texas, you go out to hill country and you just behold this, this glorious artwork that God has created. This isn't the product of chaotic evolution. It's no accident. This is the handiwork of a loving and merciful God. Uh, What's his name? Uh, The astrophysicist. Neil deGrasse Tyson once said, when I look at the world and the universe, I don't believe in a good God because all I see is, is destruction all I see is this. And, and how sad that is, that that's all he sees. He sees death. He sees an end. When the Christian looks at creation, we see God saying, I care about you. Now, you're not getting the gospel, the forgiveness of your sins by taking a walk through the wildflowers, by laying down in blue bonnets. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this is additional gift from God. Luther himself once said, the gospel is sung in the leaves on the trees. 
think I have that quote right. So it's a summary quote. It may not be the full quote. But the reality is we are free to rejoice in all of creation and to invite creation to sing with us, to rejoice with us. Look, isn't an organ a, a creation of God? It's a wind instrument. If God did not desire the wind to be there, it would not be there. The wind is given that creates this. Percussion, all these things are, are gifts from God. There's things that must be used and, and they're used to give glory to God. And why we sing with all creation is we want to give God this beautiful gift of this song as well. Kind of like how you don't just grab your wife the coconut filled chocolates on Valentine's Day from the local groceries, the local Walgreens. So you don't just sing to God something you figured out last second thinking, ah, oh, this will be enough. No, we sing them <laughs> from the depths of our conscience and we invite the depths of creation to sing along with us. Yeah, and, and certainly Psalm 96 gives voice to that. It's it's somewhat ironic, the, the criticism that you, you mentioned from the, the physicist, because the criticism that he makes, the psalm here says the exact opposite. I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but into verse 10, where the fact that God has created all these things means that the world is established. That actually gives order and shape to this creation. And, and as you said, when when we as Christians look at it, we give thanks to God for the way that he has taken what otherwise would be a very chaotic situation. And he has given order, he has established mm-hmm. it. And apart from him, that does not exist. And so, I mean, we when we look at creation, we give great thanks to God for all of those ways that he has ordered this world it's it's the exact opposite that Psalm 96, that has the, the complete opposite perspective that that physicist does. Well, exactly. And that's the beauty of it. But the world doesn't hear that. The world hears this guy who a, has a, a PhD in astrophysics and says, this is what I see. There's a scene from the movie Casablanca. Have you seen this movie? I love there Casablanca. There we go. Thanks be to God. It may be the best movie. I think it is actually. And, um, See, there we go. We can rejoice today. You've seen a movie I've seen many times and we both think it's the best ever. But you remember the scene where the Nazis are singing German, like patriotic songs. Yeah. And the, um, oh, I can't remember his name, the, the rebel, right, comes in and he hears it. And he goes up and he has them play the, the French national anthem. And everyone just roars singing it and drowns the Nazis out. And you have everyone crying and singing and it's this, but they have really nothing to sing about. The French are getting annihilated by the Nazis, yet they're belting it out saying this won't always be the case. This is where we are going. So the church sings and belts it out and silences the world. And that's the key thing is, and this is something we haven't talked about much yet today. How do we get the church there? Because, you you know, most pastors will belt it out, but we're pastors. We're, we're supposed to do that. And you'll have the occasional grandma schmoogle grouper or Uncle Phil who will belt it out. But most of us, we're kind of nervous about it. It's like, well, watch that scene from Casablanca, then I realize not everybody's singing really great. But they're belting it out because they know they are not overcome. They will overcome, and so will you in Christ. You will overcome sin, death, world, and the power of the devil. When you die, it's not the end. It's but the portal to life immortal. So you sing in the meantime so that the world can be drowned out, silenced. And then the voice of Christ is the only thing heard. Yeah, yeah. One of the places where I do think you still see people singing although it's maybe not as, as much as it used to be. It, it really struck me a couple of years ago, I was watching a, a World Cup soccer game and I don't remember which countries were playing. I know they, it wasn't the United States, <laughs> but both of the soccer teams were standing there and when their national anthem was playing, oh, yeah. they sang. You, you could see it. And I, I think you know, if, if we, can, we can recover that within the church, that when we, we're singing something even better than a national anthem in, in the church, we are singing 
This is the story of how God made us his own, how he saved us. And again, that's that's where these, these hymns are so important because they teach us what God has done for us. So they strengthen our own faith. And then that gives praise to the Lord. It proclaims his name to all nations. And that's the hymn that, that cuts through all the noise that the world needs to hear. They may react violently against it, but they need to hear it. And, and yeah, just... I don't know. Just keep singing. That's from a, that's from a movie. It's just keep swimming. Yes. Just keep swimming. But I do just, just keep, keep singing. singing. I love it. Yeah. But, but that's the thing you see, like the, the last few stand, not stanzas. See, I'm talking about hymns, last few verses of, of this song. And it's everyone rejoice, be glad. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. So we sing because of that. We're not singing to, to appease an angry idol, like it said earlier in the psalm. We are singing to our good and gracious God who loves us. When we are faithless, he's faithful, for he cannot deny himself. He is the one that loves us. He is the one that saves us. He is the one that does all things for us. So we invite everyone to sing with us this marvelous narrative This pilgrimage, not unto a life of punishment, but unto bliss supernal. And we would all be well off to see this in this psalm and then see it in our church's hymnody. Talk a little bit more about that that line there in verse. It really, in verses four and five, you get the contrast between the Lord, Yahweh, the true God, and then worthless idols. Is Talk a little bit more about the, the contrast. And again, maybe let's keep with this idea of song, the contrast between the song of the idols and the song of the true God. Well, you take the song of the idols does nothing. It, it empties. It drains you. It doesn't do anything for you. It takes from you. Whereas the song of God creates, it does something. It makes something. It it declares you a child of God. It assures you of your forgiveness and eternal salvation. The songs of the idols, they don't really do anything. Even take some of the the greatest songs ever written, some of the love songs or patriotic songs or, or, or triumph songs of this fallen world. They don't create anything. They don't make anything. What was it? Remember when Bill Clinton was elected, his campaign song was by Fleetwood Mac. You know, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. You know, and I think even Fleetwood Mac, I think even played with him at one of his rallies. That song doesn't do anything. Look at what happened to Fleetwood Mac. They do the song, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. They all got divorced and you know, had all this chaos in their life. They had, they had, they had despair and depression and all these things. Yeah, they may have had money, but they, they, they didn't have any peace. And God's song gives you peace, completeness, wholeness in him alone. He does something, whereas the worthless idols do nothing but take from you. Hmm. Hmm. And maybe one of the, the keys to recovering the church's song is to recognize the, the emptiness, the worthlessness, the do nothingness of the world's song. It, it, what's what's deceptive is that the world's song is often so loud hmm. and and wants to be heard, but it, it really can't do anything. And and just thinking through, you know, you you know the pop culture references much better than me. Hmm. But if if you think about some of the mantras that are out there, if you think about those as the world's song. So something like my body, my choice, right. or something like love is love. We're, we're just coming out of so-called pride mm-hmm. back in June. If you think about those songs, they're loud. They're in your face all the time. But with those two in particular, they really cannot make anything. In fact, they, they deny the life-giving power that God has put into his creation through procreation. And if I think perhaps if we start to realize what Psalm 96 puts puts before us, that these idols are actually worthless. They can't do anything. They can't create like the true God does. If we realize that their song is actually nothing and that the song of the church is, is truly life-giving, maybe that can, can help us to embolden our voices. Well, and it's that. And it, the reality is 
the world, I, I tell the saints at Zion this all the time, the world is always preaching to you, not for you, but to you. They're, they're not really doing anything for you, but the world is always preaching. The devil is always preaching. Death is always lingering around. You have their song all the time. You are always in worship, either to the one true God or to the worthless idols of this world. You're never outside of worship. You're always worshiping. And it's getting into that context like, oh, so when I go to the the swim meet all day long, and and I bring this up because my kids are on a swim team, I'll devote 11 hours that day to that swim team. But will I sit and sing hymns for 11 hours? No, that's crazy. Why would I do that? That's such a waste of time. Or I'll go to work for nine hours a day. I'll do my hobbies for multiple hours a day. I'll watch the news for multiple hours a day. I'll read. I'll listen to podcasts. I'll do all these things instead of hearing the voice of Christ. So one thing I've told people is, where are you going? You have a destination. It's, it's when you put your, your destination in in Google Maps, you, you don't say, OK, you tell me to go north. Well, I'm going to drive south and assume I'm going to get to the place where I intend to go. <laughs> You're going unto the heavenly Zion, under the new creation. So we walk with each other unto that place, singing our hymns, which remind us of where we're going so that we don't get discouraged when things aren't going well, so that we don't get distracted when things may not be going as fast as we want them to be. We sing and we drown out all that worthless stuff, the the side roads that are just going to get us lost and frustrated instead of going on that one path, which is Christ himself. I think Psalm 96 gives us this directional idea because as we mentioned at the outset, this Psalm was used when the Ark was brought into Jerusalem. And and even within the Psalm, for example, in verse eight, you have this bring an offering, come into his courts language, this idea of going somewhere and that somewhere in Psalm 96, at least in part, is going to where the Lord is. Talk a little bit about that directional language, this coming before the Lord in his sanctuary. Well, and that's the thing. This is where the Lord comes to us. He comes to us not because he's limited, but he limits himself for our sake. So we don't have to go out and play hide and go seek with God. He comes and says, I will be here for you. And that's the, I was almost going to go into the friends intro there, but I, I, I stopped myself. The reality is God is there for you. And we sing as we enter into his sanctuary here. As we are being prepared to enter into his courts forever. We sing it in a lot of our other hymns. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked ones. Uh, I look, I lift up mine eyes to the hills from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. You look at all of these Psalms is directional. I'm on this path toward eternity. And everything is in that context. Everything that happens in my life. Take the, it's, it's even, we even take you and me, brother. Um, How hypocritical are we that we act like the world when it comes to how we live? I have a pension, a 403B savings and all these things. And most people would say, well, you are wise. You are prudent. You are making sure that as you get old and people don't want to take care of you, you can take care of yourself. Is basically what's being said, but no one wants to say it that way. Because we've convinced ourselves we're not being worldly. But the reality is, everything you do is on the pilgrimage toward eternity. And that's not to guilt you, it's to free you. So spend time in the word, be in the word. I said this to the saints earlier this week. I said, after you gossip, do you feel good? After you lust, do you feel good? After you cheat and lie? Do you feel good? After you take money from someone, do you feel good? No, you feel terrible. But when you sing a hymn, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, when you listen to a sermon and hear it and and really digest it, when you sing the great hymns, when you sing the intro, when you sing the Agnus Dei, the Magnificat, the Nuc Dimittis, the Benedictus, the Gloria and Excelsis, 
No, you really, this is, this is what your life is supposed to be. This is what it's all about. That other stuff is just worship to worthless idols. Talk more about toward the end of the Psalm where it particularly say in verse 10 and then in verse 13, well, it's, it's all in verse 10, actually say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. These two, two things that the Lord does there, he reigns and he judges are, are pretty prominent here in Psalm 96. Why, why are those such prominent themes? Why are they good news for us as Christians? Well, they're good news. If you know who Jesus is, <laughs> if you know who Christ is, when you see that Christ is the one who reigns, but from where does he reign? He reigns from the tree of the cross. What does he do from the tree of the cross? He bears the sin of the world. He bears your sins. He stands in your stead as the sinner. So not only does God destroy the sin and the sinner too, because Christ died so that he may judge with equity, meaning he does not judge you falsely. He doesn't take your sins into account when judging you. He judges you according to his righteousness. He judges you according to his work on the cross so that when the father sees you, the son who all authority has been given to says, this one's good. He's with me. I died for him. I died for her. I died for them all that they may reign with you, that not reign, live with you eternally, father. And it's beautiful when we see Christ as our righteous judge who doesn't terrify us but judges us and reckons us righteous according to his grace by faith alone. So we have, and we've talked about these verses already, I think in verses 11 through 12, just this overwhelming joy of creation. It's quite the, quite the scene to picture in your head. You know, the heavens are glad. The earth is rejoicing. You've got the sea roaring, the field, the trees, All of this is singing together and we get to join in that praise. The reason in verse 13 is that's when the Lord is coming. So before the Lord, for he comes, what's the significance? And and maybe when, when does this happen that the Lord comes? He comes now and he will come on the last day. This is beautiful, like Advent one preaching. In the one-year lectionary, Advent 1 is Jesus entering Jerusalem. So the Palm Sunday narrative. He came once in the flesh as the Son of God manifest in the flesh in Jesus Christ. He now comes to us here in the means of grace, baptism, the Lord's Supper, holy absolution, the gospel preached, and the mutual conversation and consolation of the brethren. He comes to us and abides with us to judge us righteous, holy, and forgiven. So on the last day, then, we've kind of gotten a sneak peek. God ruined the surprise. We've been judged already in Christ. So on the last day is not terror for us, but joy, final release unto the new creation. So we look forward to that great and awesome last day when all flesh will be raised, bodily resurrected to enter unto what has been created for us, before the foundation of the world, not inherited because we earned it, but because Christ worked it out for us on the cross. I'm glad you brought in Advent because I do think there's a very strong Advent feel to this. And I know, you know, here we are in the middle of the summer. It's really hot in Texas, right? Mm-hmm. Now. But to think about Advent, I think is so helpful because that is what Advent is all about. The coming of the Lord And I think, you know, even with this Psalm, you have the Advent flavor and also the Christmas. I believe Psalm 96 gets used for one of the, I don't know if it's Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, but I think it shows up in the, somewhere in in one of those celebrations. And I think verse 13 fits very well. The the hymn, since we're talking about singing, Joy to the World, Mm -hmm. I think was more, more based on Psalm 98 than Psalm 96, but there's some big parallels, I think. That this idea, you know, joy to the world, the Lord is come, mm-hmm. which is is certainly a Christmas celebration, but does expand so much more than that. You could really sing joy to the world. I mean, anytime you're thinking about the last day, 
joy to the world would be an appropriate hymn. That that might be something to try this coming what, into the church year. Pastor yeah. Paul, sing joy to the world like at the end of November instead of on Christmas Day and see what happens. Well, I, I believe it was Isaac Watts that wrote that, right? Isaac Watts, I think, did joy to the world. That's correct. Yes. And if I recall reading, he didn't write that originally as a Christmas hymn, but just as a hymn of praise. And it's interesting mm. Who made it a Christmas hymn is the world. We're like, okay, we're going to make this and you only get it one day a year instead of something every day. The reality is God and man made manifest has changed everything. He's changed every day of your life. And it's so easy to forget that because we get so warped, so wrapped up in the worthless. Can you imagine if we actually saw the worthless idols for what they are? It's like when a girl finally realizes that guy she likes is good for nothing. She then finally sees how bad he is, how terrible he is, how, oh, yeah, I see all the acne now. Oh, I see his beat up car. I don't know why I ever fell for him. Well, we don't know either, girlfriend. You know, I don't get it. But you see it now. The reality is your entire life from womb to tomb in Christ, from font to grave is changed. And therefore, we sing about it. So the only way to get that is that squealo, singing it out, singing it loud, singing it to each other, because every day is pride day for the Christian, not pride in ourselves, but doing exactly as St. Paul said, if I'm to boast, I shall boast in the Lord Christ. That is my boasting, not in my strength, but in his, for his power is made perfect in my weakness. You know, if you're really looking for a song that cuts through the noise, try singing Joy to the World in the middle of July hmm. and look at the funny faces that you'll get from people. But what a, what an opportunity to use that new song of what the Lord has done as a way to grab people's attention so that you can proclaim to them Christ, this God who reigns over all things, who judges the world in his righteousness that he gives freely for for his sake by his grace what a what a beautiful way so go ahead and, and sing joy to the world here in the middle of july you have at least two pastors permission mm. to do so and more than that you have the lord's permission to do so so sing dear christian sing pastor hall we got about two minutes here on the morning help us to wrap things up on psalm 96 well, i believe we've covered almost everything with it really the ending is everything he judges you in righteousness and according to his faithfulness You are not judged by your failure. You are not judged by your depravity. You are not judged by your sin, your complete deadness. That is not how you are judged. You are judged according to Christ's righteousness, by the reality that he has finished all the work for your salvation on the cross. That's what has happened for you. You are ransomed. You are freed. You are delivered from sin, death, world, and the power of the devil by your Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. So what do you do in the meantime until you get to be with him unto the ages of ages where there is no sin, there is no sadness, there is no death? Until then, let's just keep singing. Let's sing the Advent hymns. Let's sing the Easter hymns. Let's sing the Lenten ones, the Holy Week ones, the Trinity ones, the end of the church year ones, the trust, the hope and comfort. Let's sing the Psalms. Let's sing the canticles. Let us sing together. Let's sing in St. Louis and sing in Fort Wayne, sing in Tomball, sing in Smithville, sing in Dallas, sing in Seattle, sing in Rome, Paris, London, and St. Petersburg. Just sing. Because it's fun times walking together in our life together, joyfully knowing we're all going to a fantastic place. Pastor Chris Hull is pastor at Zion Lutheran Church in Tomball, Texas, helping us today with Psalm 96. Pastor Hull, thanks for being our guest. As always, thank you for having me, Brother Apple. It was fun times. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sing, dear Christian, sing. Sing to the Lord a new song, the song of his salvation, the song that we will sing together for all eternity. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.